Hello and welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 41. Today, John and I do some catching up on our Iowa hunts, our Ohio hunts, and we also talk about what we're thankful for. And of course, we're discussing the recent celebrity poaching news. So stay tuned. What is up? You are listening to the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast, and as always, I'm your host, Clint Campbell, episode number 41. Uh, John and I are doing a little bit of a catch-up today. Before we uh, jump into that, I have two pieces of a quick housekeeping that I wanted to do. First and foremost, I want to announce the Ozonics HR200 winner. Uh, we did the drawing. Thank you, everyone, for sharing and liking that post. We appreciate your your participation in that, but the, this, uh, this giveaway's winner, uh, the Ozonics unit, is going to Benjamin Murray. Uh, Benjamin, if you're out there listening, which I hope you are, I'll reach out to you on Facebook and I will drop you an IM. We'll get your mailing address and all the uh, information and go ahead and get that uh, that that unit shipped out to you. So congratulations to you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for, for taking part in the giveaway and I hope you enjoy the Ozonics hunting unit. I hope it brings you a bunch of success in the in the in the in the years coming up and in the, in the future here. Uh, the second thing I wanted to make mention of is that we're going to be doing yet another giveaway. I figured, you know, talking to John that we are nearing the holiday season and we are uh, in the giving mood here at the Truth From The Stand podcast. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to give away an Exodus uh lift to trail camera. Um, our buddies at Exodus uh, have uh, been gracious enough to give us uh, a unit to give away. And so we want to get it in the hands of the, the folks out there listening. So the way you will enter for this one is we're going to do things just a little bit differently. We're going to actually have you sign up for our email newsletter at truthfromthestand.com on our about page. If you enter or sign up rather for the email newsletter, you will automatically be entered into the opportunity to win the drawing of the Exodus uh, Lift 2 camera. Uh, the other way that you can enter is you can also use the sign up button on our Truth From The Stand Facebook page, and it'll take you to the same sign up form and get you into that newsletter uh, mailing list, and we'll enter you for an opportunity to win the Exodus Lift, uh, Lift 2 camera. So that's pretty easy. Wanted to make it easy peasy for you folks out there. Uh, just want to make sure I get this camera in your hands. Those are the two pieces of housekeeping. And now without further ado, we'll go ahead and, and get into the good stuff where John and I talk about our Ohio hunts, his Iowa hunts, and of course, the recent news of the celebrity poaching incident that's been uh, filling up our social media feeds. So stay tuned. Let's take a quick moment to hear about our partners at Whitetail Institute of North America. As you all know by now, I've been using Whitetail Institute products for several years, and you've heard me talk about the larger plots I use on our family farm. But today, I wanted to share my experience that I've had with micro plots this past year. This year, I decided to hunt a small three-acre parcel that is adjacent to a large tract of public land and a farm that doesn't allow hunting. Now, this is also taking place in a super high-pressure area of eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, this three acres is, is by and large a transition area for the deer with very little bedding, and that it, this is really the route that they take to and from bed and food. I used White Tone Institute of North America's bow stand to create a microplot, maybe 20 feet by 20 feet. Bow stand is designed to work in hard to reach areas with less than ideal soil conditions and reduced light exposure. This microplot is not intended to be the prime food source, only to slow down visiting deer long enough to provide a shot opportunity. And that is exactly what this did, or this plot did this past weekend when I harvested my Pennsylvania buck. He was stopping at a licking branch on the edge of the food plot on his way to his nighttime feeding destination. Products like bow stand are designed to tip the odds in our favor in hard to hunt places. If you're hunting areas like this small parcel, then I encourage you to consider tactics like using microplots. And if you'd like to learn more about Whitetail Institute of North America products, visit them at whitetailinstitute.com. And now back to the show. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and today you've got the lovely pleasure of listening to just John and I talk about deer hunting, the the ups, the downs, the trials, the tribulations, and everything that's going on in the deer world. But first, man, how you uh, how you living out there in Iowa? Man, I am grinding is how I'm living. <laughs> I've been better. 
I've yeah. had more sleep before. Yeah, if you, if you hear that grinding sound, anybody out there listening, just randomly while you're walking, maybe you work near a grinder, maybe you work near a meat grinder. When you hear one of those sounds, just think of Johnny Utah, because that fool has been grinding for like, what is it, man? You're going on like 30 some plus days straight of, of just getting it. Yeah, pretty much. Every every chance I get, um, you know, like we were talking before we started the, the podcast, I mean, there's a lot of guys that, you know, they'll get a week off vacation or they might get two weeks vacation or, or maybe they just hunt, you know, the weekends and, and stuff like that. Um, I haven't really had that luxury to have like a big group of days together. Um, it's been, you know, hunt the morning, come home, do my day job. And then maybe I'll have a couple hours at the end of the day uh, to run back out. And I'm fortunate that a lot of my spots are real close to the house, so I can I can save myself some time. But it's just been nonstop <laughs> like that, you know, for about a month. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where, you know, I think those of us who, and I'll count myself in this group, of course, that think that, you know, man, it'd be great if I had a place close to my house I could, you know, that I could get out in the mornings and then maybe after work. But then there's the flip side of it where it's like I'm kind of I'm picking up what you're putting down because, you know, hunting season, there's a lot of stress involved, right? It's like it's all the preparation that you do all year long. And you, of course, want to make all that work and effort pay off. Right. So there's that added need to try to get something done or at least have the experiences that you want to have. And. You know, I think sometimes I get stressed out because I'd like to hunt more. But then in hindsight, I kind of think about it and I'm like, you know what? I have these episodic moments to go hunt, whether it's the two weeks in, you know, Montana and then a week in Ohio. And then I do some weekend stuff and you try to get the kiddo out and, and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, maybe that's the best bet because it's really all that like all that work and stuff. And it's like these these specific moments in time I have to get it done. And if it doesn't happen, then it's kind of like. I don't have a whole lot that I can do after that because it's like the vacation is spent. I have to live with whatever the outcome is. And then I don't have to dwell on it anymore because there's just not another opportunity. You know what I mean? To where it just kind of cuts off that stress valve. What do you, what do you think? Do you think it's uh, I guess it's 50, 50, I guess there's some pros and cons to each, each kind of approach. Yeah. I mean, cause I think that's a lot of times whenever, you know, we talk about what it is we're doing when we're hunting. Sure. We're, we're going out, we're hunting for deer and, and, um, but there's that relaxation part of it too. Um, and I think it personally, I think if, if a guy can take a week or two weeks and know that while they're gone, they're truly on a vacation, mm-hmm. uh, work's not going to call. They're not getting work emails to deal with. Um, to me, it's more relaxing mm-hmm. and, you, you enjoy every single minute that you're out there more, um, you know, to describe one of my hunts, um, it, it was a vacation day and right as the sun's coming up, you know, it's eight o'clock, you get four or five emails. Hey, mm-hmm. need you on a conference call today at 11. So now immediately my thought goes from, wait a second, I'm on vacation. How am I going to get out of this conference call? But if it's really important, I need to be on the conference call. You know, my, my day job kind of comes first right. and it's, so then you're sitting there and the next thing you know, 30 minutes has gone by and you're like, I haven't even really paid attention and enjoyed myself in the woods. Cause I'm thinking about this work obligation or, or something. So I, man, I'll be honest. I, I think it would actually be, it's nicer if you know that you have a set amount of time that you can just zone in, um, and focus on the hunt and not going, not going back and forth, back and forth, you know, work, hunt, work, hunt, work, hunt, um, right. kind of gets you off your game a little bit, I think. Yeah, I would definitely, I, I think you're right. I think, I think if we were building the perfect, did you ever see those like football games or bat? I know you're more of a Kentucky basketball guy, but whenever they do those things, maybe like during commercials where they build, build the perfect player, you know, they'll build the perfect quarterback and it's like, you know, Tom, <laughs> yeah. Tom Brady's brain with, Aaron Rodgers' arm and Ben Roethlisberger's leg or whatever it is, right? It's like if you were building right, the, right. Perfect, the perfect hunting scenario, I think it's that you have enough vacation time that you can take that dedicated time to get that peace and quiet, right, to where you can just focus. And then you uh-huh. have hunting spots close enough to you that whenever you get done taking that dedicated time that you have the ability to go out for the mornings and the evenings if you need to, right? It's kind of like your ace in the hole. Like I think that would sure. be perfect because then – you can kind of take the pressure off a little bit of knowing that you have that, that like 
block time that you're going to get to go get the relaxation component of it. But you also have the ability to be very, um, what am I trying to say here? Very, I guess, nimble or agile with your with your hunting time to where it's like if you need to sneak out for a couple hours here or there because you've got great intel on a deer you've been watching or whatever then that becomes a lot easier to kind of achieve so that to me would be like the perfect deer hunting quarterback would be that yeah both those scenarios so I think, as I said at the top, you know, uh, for all you guys out there listening, it's uh, John and I just kind of doing a catch up because we've really not had a chance to catch up and talk hunting in a, in a little while. Um, and I think what we're going to cover today is, uh, you know, for, first off, we're going to do an Exodus giveaway here at some point during the show, uh, which uh, if you go ahead and listen in closely, we'll give you the details here at some point how you can get involved in that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we want to touch on, too, that's kind of been timely and been in the news a lot lately is is uh, the issue of poaching. So we definitely want to touch on that. We'll, we'll cover, you know, some of the, the the stuff that John and I went through on our, uh, you know, his his hunts in Iowa. And then, of course, my, my trip to Ohio that I took. And then we'll talk a little bit about what our plans are for the rest of the season. Because as we know, in a lot of states, at least in Pennsylvania, bow season closes for a week before rifle season comes in. And then it doesn't come back in until like roughly the day after Christmas statewide. Um, I know other states don't necessarily do that, but, um, you know, I guess the, what you would consider maybe the heart of bow hunting season is kind of drawing to a close if it hasn't already for a lot of folks. Um, but that doesn't mean it's completely over. So we'll talk about what our plans are as we move in toward the late season, uh, portion of the, of the hunt. And then of course we'll announce the, uh, the winner of the Ozonics, uh, giveaway that we did, uh, in episode 40. So stay tuned for that and we'll make that announcement. So first, man, what do you want to tackle? Do you want to attack your uh, your Iowa hunting, my Ohio poaching? What what's uh what's what tickles your fancy here? <laughs> um, we can go into the hunting side. All right, cool. You uh, you want to? I, I think yours is probably more exciting than mine. So it's, it's, <laughs> let's start with Iowa. Um, so okay, there is a. I, I picked up a piece of property that's right down the road from me. It's not a lease. Uh, it, it's funny whenever. You tell people like, you know, I, I hunt a piece of property. People are always very quick to ask, well, is it a lease or do you just have mm-hmm. permission to hunt there? Right. And to me, I don't know that it really matters. You <laughs> right. know what I mean? Like it, you, you're allowed to hunt a piece of property that you don't actually own. So it's kind of like that's the end of it. But um, nonetheless, this was this was a, a, a door knock deal. Um, I actually picked up this piece during turkey season and then came back and got access um, for for bow hunting uh, this year. But um, there was a there was a buck. Um, I used some Mrs. Dopey and uh, did a landmine. Got a picture of a really good buck, uh, nice mature deer. Looked like he'd probably go in the 60s somewhere. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, kind of put a plan in motion. Uh, as much as I could, I didn't have a lot of intel on the deer. So I tried to do some observation sits and I wasn't seeing him. But then what I like to call scrape season, he started showing up very, very regular. Um, and I knew what scrapes he was kind of hitting more. Uh, it kind of told me what side of the property, at least I thought he was moving, uh, moving into. And um, got a plan in, uh, hung, a, hung a tree stand set and um, had the deer come in. On October 26, he came into a shooting lane, but he came in head first. As mm-hmm. um, soon as he came in, he didn't work the scrape. Um, and I'm at full draw. My buddy Jesse, who's uh, who's on the web show with me, he uh, he was filming, and um, I couldn't take an ethical shot. You know, if I would have laid a shot, it was going to slide. It was a hard, hard, hard quarter two. You know, and I can right. already see it. I'm like, this thing's going to slide right up the ribs, and I've got nothing. So. Um, I kind of waited and he, he didn't like the mojo in that area. And, and he, he backed out and he trotted across the field and we played cat and mouse with him a little bit. Um, I, I grunted at him a few times. I got him to kind of halfway commit, uh, but we lost shooting light. Um, we had, we were well beyond camera light, but I'd also lost shooting light right. as well. So I wasn't able to, uh, to, to do anything. And we were kind of baffled because we had the wind in our favor so we went back and we watched the footage and there was a leaf right above my head and the leaf was blowing towards me. And right about the time that he stepped into the shooting lane, you see that leaf then change and start flickering towards him. Mm-hmm. We just picked up a little bit of a swirl and I mean, had we had another five seconds, three seconds, 
Um, you know, I, I'm convinced that he was going to work that scrape and I could have, um, could have at least launched an arrow in, in his general vicinity, mm-hmm. uh, hoping that it found its mark. But, um, nonetheless missed that opportunity. And, um, then things kind of went, uh, that was during that we had a cold snap kind of a pre-rut cold snap and it had a lot of deer on their feet and, and, and hunting was good. And there was a lot of bucks that were getting shot all over the Midwest. And so it was very encouraging. Uh, probably one of the best pre-ruts that I've, I've ever got to bow hunt in any state, but, um, fast forward to November 8th. Um, my plan was the, the neighbor across the street had a lot of standing corn and I felt like that was holding a lot of the does up. Um, they were bedding down, they were hiding in that standing corn. There was a nice draw, uh, further South of that standing corn. So I started transitioning a lot of my stands and my sets, um, to the Southern end of, my, of this property to get as close to that standing corn as I could. And, uh, it all worked out. I was self-filming one day in a ground blind actually. And I'm not a, a big fan of ground blind hunting necessarily um i think it's probably a little bit of add i like to just be able to see more and look around (laughs) but um nonetheless i was i was in the ground blind and um i checked to my left and then when i look to my right i see i see the head and antlers you know of this buck and i see um i do a very very quick assessment i look out I saw big, thick tines, um, but then I looked at body. I looked at body, and I said, you know, on the hoof, I'm calling this deer a a five-and-a-half-year-old deer, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even six, but definitely a a huge, huge, huge buck. And, you know, a guy coming from Kentucky getting to see firsthand, you know, five-and-a-half, six-and-a-half-year-old Iowa buck, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this is a horse with horns, you know? (laughs) Um, And... I'm like, I reach for the, I reach for the camera and he actually busted me reaching for the camera. And I'm like, Oh no, you know what I mean? And uh, it's one of those things where I I go back to, I hate self-filming and, and I, and I still to this day help, you know, hate self-filming, but, uh, I went to reach for the camera a second time and he busted me again. And I'm like, Oh, this is now I, I was using a decoy that day. And the decoy was facing away, which was kind of odd that he was approaching the decoy from behind. Um, But nonetheless, that kind of kept his attention long enough that I made the decision that I'm not going to get a third chance to reach for my camera. So I've got to just go ahead and reach for my bow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went ahead and came to full draw. Um, I estimated him to be 20 to 23 yards away. Um. I settled, settled my pin, um, just, you know, a lot of people, they look at the shoulder, you know, the shoulders kind of L shaped. So, um, what may people, you know, I was aiming behind the shoulder, but it's really kind of dead center of the shoulder Mm -hmm. technically. Um, but it, it would have been, you know, behind the bone, but, um, I released the arrow I watched my my Luminoc, um completely drill into buried all the way you know to Fletchings, and he spun and took off and I immediately then I turned the camera on and did a did a little interview and right. was kind of gathering my thoughts you know replaying everything in my head and and I'll be honest I mean when I watched the arrow hit I wasn't thinking done you know done deer you know he'll be dead in thirty yards or forty yards right. I was thinking eh. That's a nine out of 10 shot. You know, I'm happy with that shot. I got full penetration. Um, I'll have a dead deer. So, um, I actually, I called my wife and, um, said, Hey, you know, I just shot a buck and it's a, it's a good buck. Mm -hmm. Um, I counted four on the left side and I'll, I'll explain later. (laughs) Right. Um, so She's like, okay, what are you going to do? I said, well, you know, I'm going to wait a while. Um, I'm probably just going to back out and come to the house. And after you take the kids to school and come home, then we'll gather up a little track party. And I was going to put her on the camera and we'll film the recovery and we're good. So that's exactly what I did. And and I was talking to a buddy of mine, um, another guest um, that we've had on the show, Donnie Wilson. Mm -hmm. I was talking with Donnie. 
And Donnie says, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to wait and get, grab a cup of coffee. And he's like, you know, good move. And he, he coined the phrase, he says, you know, if he's dead, he's just going to be more dead. Right. Um, <laughs> so I said, yeah, that's kind of, that's what I was thinking. Right. But, um, anyways, um, uh, I w- went back out there. I gathered up my next door neighbor. Um, he's an older gentleman, super, super awesome guy. And, uh, he's like, heck yeah, I want to go on a track job. He was like, excited that i invited him to come along you know right. and uh, so we all went out there and we had great blood uh for about 30 yards and then then i found blood spraying on both sides so you know what that means mm-hmm. i'm like oh boy you know any mm-hmm. minute now i'm gonna walk up on a white belly mm-hmm. um so we're tracking tracking we track another 20 yards and then the blood becomes just like one little speck <laughs> and it crosses the road and then I'm, you know, that feeling of confidence, that nine out of 10 starts becoming a six out of 10, a five out of 10, a four out of 10. And, uh, we ended up long story short, we ended up grid searching. There was five of us total. Uh, we searched for about six and a half, seven hours. Um, nothing. I came back out the next day, uh, with my drone and actually flew my drone overhead um, th- there's all that standing corn. You got brown right. dirt, brown corn, brown deer. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I'm like, maybe I can cover something and I can, I can pick up something with some drone uh, stuff, but it also gave me another aerial to look at some other pieces of timber that he might've gone to. And the neighbor, uh, had given me permission, you know, to access his piece. And he says, Hey, if you got blood crossing the fence, by all means, rock and roll, you know? Right. That's nice. Of um, we searched, we searched and, and nothing. I came back home, watched all the drone footage and, um, man, talking about just a pit, it just a nasty, nasty in the pit of your stomach. Just it's horrible. Yeah. I've never not recovered a deer before. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been hundred percent bow hunting, uh, exclusively since, I don't know, exclusively since probably oh nine oh eight maybe um but i mean we're talking 35 40 deer you know that i've shot since then um uh, 11 being bucks and this is the first one that i've ever not recovered in my life right and you know people are like oh man that's a that's a heck of a streak that you had going there uh you were probably overdue and i'm like no no, I don't want to accept that. You know right. what I mean? Right. Um, but so this is the first time I've had to deal with that. I've heard of other people doing it. Um, I know people that have recovered or uh, not recovered several deer, you know, right. and, I, and and as a bow hunter, that's something that you have to understand. And before it happened to me, I even had the mindset of it's going to happen someday. Right. Yeah. Um, but I didn't think this was going to be the one. You know, like maybe you gut shoot one or you get one way back or maybe it's way forward, you know. Right. This one, not in a million years did I ever think that I was not going to recover this, you know, this deer. I've had less than par shots on deer before that I've recovered. So, you know, I it's, it's just one of those freak things. Um, I've had great success with my equipment that I'm, that I'm using right now. Um, you know, up until this point, and I can't blame, I can't blame it on any of the equipment at all. I just think it was literally one of those freak things. And I mean, I studied whitetail anatomy charts, uh, relentlessly since then. And I still to this day say I got, I still got lung and probably top of heart. Um, so it's, it's just crazy how tough those things are too, man. I mean, it's like you see, it's I mean, insane. It's 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 nuts. I mean, I know you mentioned. I remember. I mean, we talked. I think it was the day that this happened when we were, when I was in Ohio. I had some cell service for a minute, and I gave you a quick call or whatever. Um, uh-huh. And that standing corn across the street, man, definitely doesn't do you any any favors. Did they happen? I know you you weren't sure when they were going to be taking that off. Did they take <laughs> it off yet? <laughs> no, they went through the center of it and they did one pass. Um, they, they did one pass, maybe two passes. I don't know how big of a combine they've got, but, um, but no, that's it. That's all they've done. And so at this point, I don't know if they're waiting, which I have talked to the farmer. He relayed a message to the combine operator. Um, do your best to look out and uh, ahead of the cones and see if you, you know, if you see a deer, please stop. Um, right. 
I've talked to a couple of neighbors on both sides, uh, gave them a heads up. There's even a guy that's doing a little bit of logging. He's not really a logger, but he's doing a little bit of timber work. I talked to him and his wife and gave them a heads up and said, look, you know, he's a, he's a big, heavy, um, uh, he's four point on the left side. Um, I, I know which deer it is after going back and looking at trail camera pictures, um, the reason why I initially thought he was a big eight, uh, this buck actually has a, has a main beam that's broke off mm-hmm. after his G four and, um, but his right side's clean, but, um, he's a hammer. It's, it's yeah. a buck that I've sent you a picture of before. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he's a, he's a hammer man. And I, I think even with his busted, uh, main beam, I still think he's going to go in the upper fifties to low sixties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a stud. Um, just for sure. makes you sick, man. You know, and 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 tying length and inches aside, you know, it's a five and a half year old, six and a half year old deer. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the part that hurts more yeah. than anything is, um, you know, the only at this point, the only thing I can hope for is that um, he's a one lung champ and he's out there living still today, and hopefully, he got to enjoy the rut some more and right. post rut some more. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, man, I know what you, I know what you mean. It's one of those things where knock on wood, you know, I've kind of in a similar boat, not quite as many of the uh harvests as as you have had. Um but I've not, you know, as soon as I say this, I'm going to jinx, my, jinx myself, but not lost one um yet and it was you know right after we had that conversation, you know, I was in Ohio hunting and I was just like, man, I was like, I don't know what I would I don't know what I would do. You know what I mean? I was like it's just one of those things where it's uh it's you know it's bound to happen you know what i mean it's one of those things where it's just like you know riding a bike it's like you ride a bike long enough you'll you'll fall off it you know what i mean it's just yeah. it's one of those things but it, you know this you always think like you'd mentioned where the ones that get away off sometimes or i would say often like after you look back and you think about the shot you placed you know what i mean like for those who have lost it's like a lot of times you're like, eh, man, that probably, I, I just, I, I, I torqued the shot a little bit, or I just, you know, I, I popped my head up off my sight just for a second. Cause I was excited or I didn't follow through on my release or there's something that, you know, you probably kind of didn't do a hundred percent, right. You didn't do everything you uh-huh. should have done or whatever. And gave you a marginal shot and it kind of gets you the result that you get. But whenever you place a shot that is, you know, and I, I know that you're a good shot. And so whenever you say it's 23 yards, it's like, I mean, I don't ever want to call like an archery shot, a chip shot, but I know, you know, you're, you know, how you, you know, work with your, your equipment and stuff like that. And that you shoot distance and, in in and those types of things where it's, you know, 23 yards, I won't call it a chip shot, but it's, you look, you want that shot. <laughs> that's the shot that you want to have, you know what I sure. mean? Like that's the, uh, um, so I know that that shot, when you say that the shot placement was good, it's like, there's no doubt that the shot placement was good. It's just, man, those things are tough as nails, and especially, man, I'll say this too. It's like, I've killed deer, of course, in Pennsylvania and then this, you know, Midwest in terms of Ohio. And I've not like those Midwestern deer, man. I don't know what it is about them, but they are brutes, dude. Like they are just, they're hammers. Like they're tough. Like I've never seen deer get just waylaid with a broadhead like they will and just in run for what seems like hundreds upon hundreds of yards. You know what I mean? It's like, I just, I've never seen it before. You hit one like that in PA and it's like, you know, the one I shot this year, I mean, it was you know 40 yards and he was piled up and I've shot him just as well as I shot that buck last year in Ohio. And he ended up running like a hundred and 150 yards or whatever, you know, with one through his mm-hmm. wheelhouse. And I just, it's amazing how tough they are. There was, um, a friend of mine, he lives a little bit North of me. Um, he he went out with a buddy of his to recover his buck and, and they searched all day and the next day they were dedicated went back out looked at some aerials and topos and they found an area that they hadn't searched yet that they thought there was a chance he might have gone to and they ended up recovering the deer hmm. once they field dressed him uh, they unzipped him and they determined that it was a double lung hit and then they they used that little um that little application you can use on Google Earth. And they tracked it to where that deer ran nine tenths of a mile on a double lung hit. <laughs> I mean, that's just insane. That's Yeah. I mean, it's like holy cow. And and you know, no blood. You know, yeah. they had they had good blood for a while. Um, but like the last half mile was just literally a grid search. Right. I stubbed my toe and it's like I I need a doctor. 
You know what Dude, I mean? It's like <laughs> you you shoot me with a broadhead, I'm gonna fall over and cry and just die right there. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like their will to survive, uh, and I, and, I, and it goes back to the reason why you know guys like us that we respect the heck out of those animals is their will to survive. It's just unbelievable, and um, and that's the thing. I mean, I you know, hey, anybody listening that's that's a bow hunter. We've all had a marginal shot on a deer that yep. we have recovered. And yep. it's one of those things where you're like, wow, I'm actually surprised that deer died so fast. Mm-hmm. Or I'm surprised that, you know, I recovered that animal. Um, I would place this shot in my top three all-time shots that I've ever put on a deer. Right. You know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. And it's almost disheartening, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it... Uh, It made me, um, well, for two days after that, I had mentioned earlier when we were talking before we started recording, there was two days that I haven't hunted, and those were the two days. Right. Um, The alarm went off in the morning. I turned off the alarm and and didn't get up and go hunt that morning. And I, um, man, I was just so upset. I was, I was, I was ticked off, you know, like why, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I did all my homework and and I I got in a position and and figured this deer out and and then to have this happen and, and then of course then immediately it goes into man I feel bad because I inflicted pain on this animal maybe he died maybe he didn't mm-hmm. but I didn't recover this animal so we always go for that um you know you want a quick a quick kill yeah. uh and that obviously didn't happen so, uh, and I'm thinking, is this animal out there laying out there getting eaten by coyotes? Is he, is he limped up and, uh, coyotes were able to get a hold of him. And I'm just like, I start thinking about all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, this just sucks. And I, and I didn't want to hunt. Um, so the next thing I did was I took my bow out and, uh, went to my Reinhardt and started shooting arrows, just going through double checking, you know, yep. is, is my sight off? Is my rest off? And and I'm you know I'm tack driving my my target, mm-hmm. and I'm like okay, it's not the equipment, you know there there wasn't anything goofy that went on there, um, and, and like I said, my arrow went where I was aiming, so right. I, I I didn't think that it was my equipment, but it's almost like I needed to restore confidence in myself because it almost makes you nervous to even want to shoot another deer, right. you know what if this one doesn't die? Right. What if I wound another one and so, you know, you go through that kind of mental process, but, um, yeah, yeah it did is you, what it is. And, um, you know, did everything I could and, and trying to get back on the saddle and, and grind out this uh, last bit of early season. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah. And you've gotten back in the saddle and getting, and getting back after it. So that's, that's good. And it's one of those things where, you know, I have no doubt, um, that uh i think your your season's going to end up well here before uh before we all before it's all said and done at least um you're just you've put too much work in and, and, and you just have this persistence and this drive to to make it happen dude so i have no doubt that it's going to happen or at least you know i know i send you texts every now and then that i'm i'm, I'm pulling for you i think about you probably once a day <laughs> since you're out in the tree and i'm usually <laughs> usually sitting at my desk <laughs> um you know, thinking about, you know, hoping that you, hoping you get another opportunity. So there's a dude here in PA that's, uh, that's cheering you on. That's for sure. But, uh, I, I appreciate it. It's man, you know, I tell you, it's been rough. Um, you know, and, and we've kind of touched base on it a little bit. Last season I had access to a really, really, really good property, a lot of acreage. Um, you could really hunt it on a lot of different winds. You had a lot of different possibilities. Um, it also gave me my backdoor access into some public, and and it was super nice. And 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 I lost that property, uh, kind of along the lines of something a topic we're going to get into later on. But mm-hmm. um, I picked up this other piece. It's a lot smaller. Um, it's a little closer to my house, which was nice. But um, man, I tell you, this spring and this summer. Um, through my, my day job, I was working so much, so many extra hours that, um, I didn't get to do all of my homework that I would like to do. And coupled with the fact that it was a brand new piece of property, I'm a firm believer. It takes a couple of seasons to, to really learn, you know, learn a property. But, um, so this year I've been hunting a lot and, and trying to learn this new piece of property as much as I, you know, as much as I could. 
but uh yeah man it's it's been a lot of it's been persistence it's uh it's it's frustrating you know it's very very frustrating hunting a new piece of ground it can be exciting um how many people listening have had a lot of summer trail camera photos and then hard horn the deer disappear yeah um the buck that i shot he actually summers uh, all the way through velvet, he summers about a mile and a half, two miles north of me. And I know the guy who has a huge database of trail camera pictures of this deer. And then he goes hard horn during scrape season. And then he comes down to this property and he doesn't get another picture of him after September, mid September. So, you know, uh, you can pick, like I picked up this new property this year and on paper, it looked good. Aerials looked good. Um, but it doesn't hold a lot of deer and you almost have to go through a season to sometimes find out if, if it's going to hold deer in the fall or, or not. I mean, I can have all the deer I want in the summer, but if they don't stay there during the fall, then that's a problem. Right. Um, so that's one of the things I, I'm, I'm dealing with. Unfortunately, I, I found out the hard way that this property is not the mega property that I thought it was going to be. Right. Um, I did just recently go in halves on a legitimate lease, a uh, 160 acre lease, uh, with a buddy of mine. Uh, so I've got that to look forward to, to, you know, for next year, but nice. still trying to grind out this year and, and, and make it happen. I've, I've passed some good two and three year old deer. Um, there's a, a buck called the triple beam buck. I think I sent you a picture of him. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I, I saw him videoed him on the hoof and gave him a pass. Cause I think he's a, I really think he's a three year old. He could be a small four, but I, I think he's a three and, but I gave him a pass just, Hey, we'll see what he becomes. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I have seen deer and I've had some good encounters with deer. Um, but isn't that what we all want? We all want uh giant deer at right. our feet every day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned a couple of things there, man. It kind of is a nice segue to my trip to, uh, my trip to Ohio. You mentioned there, you know, just learning a piece of property, you know? So for me, you know, this year going to Ohio was, I was, I was taking a gamble, you know, cause I had a good piece last year in, in Ohio that I, that I hunted, that I had really good success on. Um, you know, I, I find kind of found kind of like a diamond in the rough, I guess you could say. Um, I, mm-hmm. I assumed that it would probably, you know, give me the same type of experience year over year with the, with the insane rut activity that I'd seen last year. I was thinking it probably would happen again this year. Actually it was confirmed cause a good buddy of mine that I went with last year, I put him in the uh, same location that I hunted last year and he, he had the same experience this year. So I had nice deer running by him, saw a couple shooters, saw one that was in the mid one forties. So for public land is pretty good. Um, but he just didn't get a shot at him. So this year though, I decided to roll the dice and go to a different piece of public ground that was, you know, big woods. Um, I went with our buddy, Chad Sylvester from Exodus. Uh, he and I went down there. We lived in a, uh, we got to know each other really well. Cause we lived in a pool behind box trailer for a week, uh, with the, with, with crock pot cooking every, every evening. And that was pretty much, we had, we had one extension cord that ran into the, uh, into the box trailer with uh, a sleeping bag and a cot. And that was our, our home for a week. So to say we were, uh, uh in some tight quarters is, is a bit of an understatement, but, uh, we were there to deer hunt regardless. So it wasn't as if we were spending a bunch of time in that, that box trailer. And you know, the, the thing with this piece of property is that, I mean, for one, it's big woods. Chad's hunted it for a while. Um, he had trail cameras all over it, of course. Um, and we checked him this year. We went and scouted it this summer. We, we put cameras up and then he'd been back a couple of times to kind of check the, do some card pools. And we had deer on camera all during the summer, early fall. Um, had a couple nice deer on camera, actually. Um, we get there the first day, um, you know, I had a kind of an idea of, of a couple of different spots where I wanted to kind of hunt without just kind of walking in. The first day was kind of one of those things where it's, let's hunt the morning. Um, if we don't really see any action, let's pull out, let's re kind of gather ourselves and then let's do, let's basically go, you know, do scouting the rest of the day and figure out what we want to make our plan for, for the week and pull some camera cards. And that's basically what we did. And we had a few pictures of deer. Um, this area has low deer density just in general, so you're not going to get run over with deer. But the crazy thing about this kind of piece of public ground is that the age structure is just really good. Um, so there is, there are some big deer, you know, there was, I think it was two years ago, there was 186 inch deer that was killed there. Um, there were two confirmed 200 inch deer that were, um, on uh, private ground, just adjacent to this public ground. Um, and then we had 160 inch deer on, on camera, um, that he called tall boy. Uh, and then a couple, 
you know, there was a 10 point that, that we had on camera that was probably in the one high 140s, low 150s, and then there was a 12 point that was probably in the in the 50s too that we had. So we had had a handful of good deer that were on camera pretty consistently. Um, mm-hmm. We get there, pull the camera cards, and we're kind of excited because I was like, man, right before we got there, we had some daylight. Like we had some some of the big boys were daylight walking, and I think it was like right around Halloween is you know roughly. And they weren't all over the cameras because you know when you're, you know, it's one of those things with the the big wood scenario that you're hunting. You're really kind of working on I guess longer lines of movement, so they're not necessarily passing through the same funnels every two days because there's not a a defined food source for them. There's not a ag field anywhere. There's not a bean field or a corn field. I mean, there's basically it's big tracks of timber with clear cuts and those clear cuts really kind of act as their food source, but really food is everywhere. Cause they're just, they're just hitting brows as they're, as they're traveling. Um, mm-hmm. so trying to figure out when they're going to pass through an area is, is, is a challenge. So you, it might be one of those things where they might come back through, but it might be a six day cycle that it takes them to get back. Um, you know, and, and where they go from there, you know, who the hell knows. Um, so we had some, some guys on camera and there was a, a, a big drainage that I was kind of eyeing up, you know, before we had got there. And I was like, you know what? The spot that I really want to hunt is this ridge um, that is lined with scrapes every year. And that was, uh, in, even going back to last year's camera photos, that was where they, we had, or I say we, I didn't hunt it last year, but that's where Chad had a camera hung that had a bunch of shooters daylight walking all through November. Like So basically from the beginning of November to the end of November, there were daylight walkers that were shooters uh, through there. Now, when I say all through there, it's not like one pass through there every day, but it's like, you know, you put in a couple all day sits and you're going to see your opportunity at a shooter. And that's kind of how this area hunts. Um, so I was like, you know what, the weather's changing. It was right before, or it was basically right after you and I had spoken and the weather was changing for the better for the rest of the week. The first part of the week was just a little bit warm, a little bit of rain. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to spend my time in this drainage. I know there's a doe bedding area on the top of this ridge on the other side. I'm, I'm figuring that's why I'm getting some of the daylight pictures that we got at the end of October, beginning of November in this drainage. So I'm going to park it here and, and just kind of hunt this doe bedding area. I think I did two full day sits there. I saw a young, I guess, well, I saw a spike the one day and then I saw, uh, just, he wasn't a shooter. It was just a rack eight that came down the one evening and that out of like two and a half days of sitting there, it was were the only deer that I'd seen, uh, during the entire set. We got some pretty nasty, uh, rain that came in. So that killed part of a day of a hunt, um, and then we did a little bit more scouting because the other thing we were running into too was just pressure like Chad had never seen before down there. Um, we were actually, I had walked into a couple of different places where we had done some scouting over the summer where I was like, you know what, I'm going to go in here um, and uh, just do a hanging hunt in this, in this area, walk in. And then as I'm walking in, there's a guy with his tree stand like 50 yards from where I'm going to go. <laughs> so it was, you know, kind of back to the drawing board on some of those days. But uh, I finally got to set up on the uh, on that uh, ridge with all the scrapes. Um, we went and scouted it, I guess, like a day and a half before that, and they were just opened up. I came back two days later, was sitting at the beginning of that ridge. They kind of make this scrape line that go, runs almost the entire length of the ridge down to this bottom. It's actually a saddle between these two between these two ridges, and uh, I saw one deer the entire time. I think I sat it, did three all day sits there, and I saw one deer, and. Uh, they just weren't hitting the scrapes like they had in the past. Um, I'm not really sure why. Um, the one tier that I did see, it kind of gave me hope. It was, he came from behind me, just a, a rack six, again, and not a shooter, um, came from behind me. He didn't pick up my scent. Um, he, he was just, I, I assume he was scent checking the scrapes, caught something, J hooked down below me and then came back up and approached the scrape from the opposite way. And it was like a dream if he was a shooter, cause he stopped at 20 yards at that scrape and just paused and it gave me the perfect broadside shot. If he just would have been about three years older, it would have been money. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) you know, but I was hoping, I was hoping I was like, Hey buddy, why don't you go tell your dad to stop by, you know? Um, and that was pretty much it, man. Like that was, I saw three deer the entire trip. Um, and, uh, I think Chad saw two the entire trip of eight days of hunting. Um, not sure where the deer went. Like I said, you know, the beginning, end of October, beginning of November, we had those deer on camera or we had a handful of good deer on camera and they just vanished. I did do a little scouting the last two days just to kind of start to formulate a little bit of a plan, uh, you know, possibly for next year. Um, I hiked to the top of this other ridge. I found a buck bed, um, on the backside of this doe bedding area. Uh, that would have been promising probably if I would have figured that out a couple days, a couple days earlier. 
Uh, but it's one of those things, man, where it's like when you're in an area that you don't that you don't have a lot of information about, you know, it's like and you did your scouting during the summer and you're still just basically going off of what you saw during the summer, some trail camera pictures and then reading topo. And that's basically what you're doing. You know, of course, I have I was with Chad and he knows the area, you know, relatively well. So he could kind of point me in the direction as far as like, you know, general areas to check out. Um but you know, it's it's one of those things where you have to try to figure out. I, I I feel like my my fail on this trip was more of not being more aggressive, um, and being uh-huh. too and being too passive on the hunt. I feel like there were hunts where I should have where I should have just got down out of my stand and just made a move because um, there's an area behind that drainage that I really liked that had these historical huge cedar rubs that were just pounded. I mean, we looked at them and they weren't being hit. Um, but I know that there's there's a bunch of private ground back there, these huge leases back in that general area um, that border that part of the public ground, and I just felt like that's where deer. I just felt like that's where deer were cruising because I know that there's doe bedding back there, and I should have made a move back there. And in hindsight, I you know I would uh, kick myself now because I'm like, man, I should have just made the hike in and just and, and hung a stand back there and went and hunted it. But you know, hindsight being 2020, you know, I guess the my learning my learning from this trip was just to when I'm hunting areas like that, that I'm just not as familiar with, I just need to be more aggressive, um, and less sure. passive. Um, but that was basically my Ohio hunt, man. It was, uh, it was one, of, I mean, it was a great time, but you know, had, had a good time with Chad, had a good time hunting. It was one of those trips like you were talking about earlier where I did just have the, the entire week off. So it was, it was, uh, it was very Zen. I got to, uh, just kind of relax a little bit. Um, and, uh, it just take in the sights and the sounds didn't see a ton of critters, but the ones I did yeah. see were, were fun. You know, it was, it, I mean, it was cool, man. It was like every deer that I had, had seen walked right up underneath my stand. And I know you and I have talked about this before where it's just cool when you can fool deer or fool animals like that to where you can be sitting right over top of them. They have no clue that you're there. Um, that always kind of gets the, gets the heart pounding just, you know, no matter if it's a shooter or not, that's always kind of a cool experience. Um, yeah, but that was kind of the trip in a nutshell, man, you know, so I'm hoping I can, I was going to try to get out there over Thanksgiving, you know, for those that are listening to this, the day we put it out, uh, this is the day before Thanksgiving. Um, but I don't think that that's going to happen now. I think I have some family obligations I'll have to tend to. So, you know, maybe late season, maybe I get to make a trip out. I'm not sure, but for right now, it looks like I'm going to eat my Ohio tag for the year. Let's take a quick break to hear a word about our partners at Exodus Outdoor Gear. Now this year I have tagged out in in Pennsylvania earlier than I usually do, so I found myself with some extra time on my hands and I plan to use this time wisely. Uh, What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to be looking at a few new pieces of public land to hunt for next year and start to formulate a game plan to get an idea of how deer use the property. Uh, Of course, want to see if there are a lot of hunters in those areas. Um, And how I plan to do this is to use my Exodus Outdoor Gear uh, trail cameras to really serve survey the ground for me while I'm not there. Uh, I know what some of you are thinking that, you know, it's, it's a risk placing trail cameras on public property uh, for fear of them getting stolen. Um, but this is where we'll go in with an Exodus trail camera. You buy yourself some some assurance because if there, if your camera is stolen, your Exodus camera is stolen while in the timber, um, they will give you a new camera at 50% off the re- original retail value. That's a big help and allows me to kind of go to these new places, these public land places, hang a trail camera and be assured and feel comfortable with leaving my camera there knowing that if something does happen the exodus trail cameras have my back so if you'd like to learn more about exodus trail cameras and how you might be able to get into one head over to exodusoutdoorgear.com oh man yeah well as uh as it sits right now i um i might be eating my missouri tag right yeah so there might be some hope um maybe uh maybe try to jump on a piece of public or something down there but uh yeah i mean i tell you we ought we in the future we ought to do a podcast on getting permission and obtaining permission to hunt property and getting them in writing (laughs) to where you know exactly when you can hunt when you can't and that is it exclusive is it not exclusive right (laughs) yeah these are all these are all issues that have been hard fought lessons that I've learned over the past year and a half or so. Yeah, I hear that. It's almost like a legal, uh, a, a uh, getting access legality uh, podcast, you know. Hey, I do teeth. know a good attorney in this area. Maybe we can get them to come on board and <laughs> um, and draft up a, a lease agreement kind of thing, you know. Right. 
Now, speaking of attorneys and, and legal issues, it's it's almost like we planned this stuff out. What a wonderful segue uh, to our next topic, to a less than wonderful, wonderful, uh, t- uh, you know, discussion point. But, you know, yes. like, we, like we mentioned at the top, um, you know, it's one of those topics that you, you hate to have to cover, um, but you you tend to need to. Um, especially sure. at this time, whenever it's you know timely and it's been in the news, but I know that you know I'm sure every, by now everyone is aware that there's a fellow who is uh, you know has a has a TV show um, you know is, is well known from from what I can understand. It's a, the odd, odd thing was is I honestly had never heard of him, um, so I, I wasn't I didn't know who he was. I had to do a little bit of investigating. Um, it's just uh, you know not sure why. It's just one of those things where it's you know I don't necessarily know everybody and don't watch every TV show, so. Um, but of course, I'm talking about the topic of, of, of poaching. You know, there was a, a fellow who um, had a show that had a two tags, I believe it was for, or one tag for Indiana, uh, and Indiana is a two buck state. There was some video, one real, buck or one buck state. I'm sorry. Yep, sorry. Yep. Uh, one buck state, um, and uh, there was some video. Um, you know, I'm not going to say anyone is guilty or not guilty at this point. That's not my place necessarily to determine anyone's uh, guilt or lack thereof. Um, but the evidence in the video seems pretty, pretty damning, um, from what I can tell. Um, and it yep. seems as though this person, at least at a minimum at this point, you know, um, is, uh, in the, in the process of losing some sponsors, um, and all the things in the, in the public scrutiny that all kind of comes along with that. Um, so, sure. and we're of course talking about the topic of poaching and, and Chris, uh, uh, what's his last name? Brackett, right? Chris Brackett. Yep. Am I getting mm-hmm. that right? Um, I yep. think the show is called Fear No Evil, and there was a, another. He has, I think, a second show that he that he's on as well. Um, I'm not exactly sure of all the names of the shows that he that he's on, but um, he has some pretty high dollar sponsors and seemed to be doing well for himself. And he's run into an issue of being, um, uh, you know, uh, called out for poaching uh, a deer or two deer, however you want to view it, in Indiana, where the video, at least, what it kind of shows is him taking it, taking a deer, and then the the one that he was really kind of wanting or that was he was hopeful to target uh steps out behind the deer that he had just harvested and um uh, you know and then and then moves to harvest the second one while only having a, a a single tag and that's what the video kind of alludes to there's a second part of the video where he has some choice words for his cameraman which was um less than uh highlighting someone's exquisite character shall we say i guess we'll put it <laughs> put it politely in that regard sure um, you know, and I think two of those things together, we obviously the, po- uh, the, the alleged poaching is, is bad enough unto itself, uh, add in how you treat someone the way he, uh, did or speak to them on, on video. And then it just kind of adds fuel to that fire. So I think we'll open up the topic of just kind of talking about poaching as a topic in general. Um, but John, I wanted to kind of start it by asking you just a question and this will kind of how we'll start, you know. I'm just always kind of curious when people do things like this. It's even like whenever we're talking about a football player or like a basketball player, an athlete, you know, and where they do something that they know they shouldn't do and they're risking everything when the return seems to be very minimal. Right. Sure. And so I guess like my initial question, when I see some of this stuff, I'm like, like, why? Like, why? Why do you why would someone poach? What? What, yeah. Just in general, right? Like, just like, you know, yeah. you know, me, Clint, who, you know, a handful of people may know, why would I do it? And then ratchet it up to the point of like someone who that is their livelihood. Like, yeah. what is the, like, why do you think people would do this? Like, why, what do you think goes through someone's head like this that get, well, makes it think that it's okay or that it's something that they need, they need to do? You know, I mean, you can look at like, Jose Canseco, Barry Bonds, Mark mm-hmm. McGuire, Sammy Sosa, you know, guys that push the envelope um, to hit more home runs. And whether that is fueled by uh, an extended contract to get more money, um, to get more fame, um, or, um, you know, that competitiveness, do whatever it takes to succeed. And, the, you know, a long time ago, there was a movie called The Program. Um, and there was a, 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 a bodybuilder, Andrew Brynarski. Um, he played the part of this guy named Latimer. And um, he's he's a football player. He's coming up on his senior year. Uh, I'm sorry, he's coming back up on, I think it's junior year. And it's in the off season. He didn't play much his freshman, sophomore year, and he turns to steroids and he does whatever it takes. And that's kind of one of the lines in the movie is he's like, you do what it takes to play. Um, 
so and i think a lot of that comes into the hunting industry as well i mean let's face it there are a couple of hunters that are out there that don't kill a lot of animals um but they still work with a lot of companies and and the message that they deliver is it you know the hunt the experience and maybe they're selling very good cinematography or something like that but for the most part 97 percent of the hunting shows that are out there it comes down to people love seeing big deer get killed and they associate a big buck if a guy kills a big buck well then he must be a great hunter you know right um and and it's sad you know you know, to, to look at it that way. But I think a lot of those guys, um, that have been wrapped up in the poaching incidents and stuff, whether they're a celebrity or not a celebrity, I think it's, um, it's just that internal drive to get a big deer or to always have a big harvest or something like that, whether it be bragging rights, um, or it's just something that internally they just, they want to do it. And, and sometimes I think, you know, people will take whatever means necessary to do it if they have to bend the law or, or blatantly break the law, um, you know, to do that. You know, I'm 39 years old. Um, there was probably a point in time in my life where I might have tiptoed along those lines, you know, when I was a teenager or something. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't. Uh, when I was a teenager, I wasn't I, I wasn't even a hunter then. But, um, you know, I'm at that point in my life, man, where – if somebody thinks that I'm not a good hunter because I didn't kill a buck, okay. You know, right. Right. <laughs> I'm not losing any sleep over it. Right. It is what it is. Like, I, you know, I I don't know everything there is to know about hunting. Every season I learn something new. Every new property I learn something new. But I I think that's what it comes down to. I think it's the industry in, in whole. It's the way that a lot of hunters are perceived that if they don't kill a big deer, then they're not a good hunter. And, um, you know, in that video, you know, it appears that, um, you know, he does shoot a very, very good buck, um, a a tall eight, I believe is how it was described. Right. And, you know, looks out a window and and sees the actual buck, this unicorn buck that he was, he was there after, um, that he was hoping to, hoping to have a harvest on while he was at that property and sees him and has an opportunity to shoot him, um, it does appear that the first shot is definitely a lethal, uh, uh, a mortal wound, uh, a shot that was placed on that deer. And, um, you know, it's, it's sad. It's, um, like I said, man, it's it, it, not knowing the not knowing what was the true motivation behind it. Was it that, that desire to have a big, big buck or was it the desire to have a big buck so you can gain monetary uh, benefit from it by increased sponsors or increased popularity and stuff like that. And the sad part is it's very hard for me to, to assume that it's a lot of the poaching is driven by anything more than I just want to have a big buck and be popular or be famous and, and stuff like that. And that's, you know, that sucks, man. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I think you, you hit it there. Right. Cause I don't think like as much as people like the easy answer, right. For folks who, who get caught up in some of the stuff is that, Oh, the pressure of having him having a show or, or someone having a show or whoever it is, him or anybody else that is, this has happened to, this happened to a gentleman last year from, I forget what company it was wild game innovations or something like that. Oh, or, the bill Busbus situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's always, you know, it's the pressure of the industry. It's this, it's that it's, you know, it, but I look at this guy right in this instance, it's like, if you look at his sponsors, this one deer wasn't going to make or break whether or not he was going to continue to have a show or wasn't going to gain him a pile more money. Because if you look at the level of sponsors that he has, he was working with the who's who. Like he was like Ram Trucks was a sponsor. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like you're working with a large automotive uh, sponsor. Like you don't get much bigger in this industry as far as like getting those types of that level of sponsorship. You know what I mean? So it wasn't going to be the difference of like, I have a little show that nobody knows about to all of a sudden I'm on television with, you know, 20 some episodes and, and a list sponsors. Like it wasn't like he was making that jump. So the value of like the return on investment was going to be very low. If you look at it from an investment standpoint, sure. You know, 
Well, the other thing that you had mentioned, you look at guys like give a, give a shout out to um, Kip Campbell over at Red Arrow. Yeah, um, you know he's he's in the top you know echelon um, mm-hmm. of hunting shows and hunting celebrities and. Man, that guy kills little bucks all the time, and he'll say I killed little bucks. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, and and he has he's had multiple hunts where they didn't harvest anything. It's yeah. not hurting his sponsorship any. No, exactly. It's like it's so it's so people are willing to kind of understand that that that's hunting because you're showing them what hunting is, not this imaginary situation where every time you go out in the woods, you, there's a deer running underneath your stand and you're killing booners. You know what I mean? Like that's just not sure. reality. Um, the other thing yep. you'd mentioned that I thought was was interesting was you'd say, you know, you know, hey, maybe when I was younger, would I tiptoe along the lines if I had hunted back then? Who knows? You know, it's like I, I grew up in an area of Pennsylvania where it's like that was common in the hunting culture was that mm-hmm. like that was just one of those things where there's some, you know, I grew up in a pretty rural area where, you know, there, there's folks that I knew growing up where it's like I don't know that they ever bought a tag. You know what I mean? Sure. But hunted every season. You know what I mean? And not just deer season, you know, turkey season, pheasant season, rabbit, like you name it, they hunted it, but I don't know if they ever bought a hunting license. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, so I think part of it too, in some places is that, that, you know, that, that part of the hunting culture still exists. You know what I mean? And I don't want to go mm-hmm. as far as to say it's like an old timer kind of like hunting culture approach. Cause that's not the right way to say it. Cause I know plenty of folks who are old timer hunters who, you know, were completely law abiding, you know? Yep. Um, you know, but some of it too is, is I think, you know, the, the, you know, like you were saying, it's like the hunting, the hunting culture to a degree, is it changing that we're putting so much emphasis? And when I say it's changing, like all the, all the attention on social media and stuff like that, that every picture, it seems like once you hit like the beginning of September and all these, you know, states start coming in with the early season and stuff like that. It's just like, man, I almost have to stop looking. Cause like <laughs> post after post after post is just like a deer. I'm like, I'll never kill one like that. That's nah, never, I'll never see one like that. You know what I mean? It's just like one of those things where it's like, if I start looking at it, I start getting that sense of like, of that's what I have. Like, that's the goal, which it's, it's not. I think we talked about this before where it's like, I had to reset my priority of like, what is, um, what is possible for me my expectations, you know what I mean? And I mm-hmm. had to like level set that, that way I, I was enjoying my hunts. Um, you know, but it's like so much of the emphasis is on, you know, how big is the deer that you killed this year? And is it, is the, is the, I guess the hunting culture shifting? And if it is, is it, is it changing people to to think that they have to go out and do this or they have to achieve X and almost by any means? Like, what do you think about that? No, I think you're exactly right. I mean, and there, and you know, there's been some other hunting celebrities that have actually stepped up and, and, um, done, they've done some live video feeds. Uh, Michael Waddell, I know in, in recent months, you know, he talked about, uh, how there, there's a problem with the hunting world right now. And there is, that's exactly what he said. There's becoming this so much of an emphasis on how big are the antlers. And, and, you know, and that's kind of one of those things where, I mean, let's, let's face it. Like, sure. Um, when I go into the woods every day, my number one goal is to have a good hunt, have fun, enjoy myself. Um, I got two bucks standing in the field and one's 150 inches and one's 110 inches. Mm -hmm. Well, chances are the 150 is probably, you know, a, a four, maybe a five year old deer and the 110 inch buck might be a one or a two year old might be three year old. Either way, you know, my goal is to, is to target mature deer. Mm -hmm. Um, do we, do we all want to have a big impressive deer? Sure. You know, um, but that also comes with the age class, you know, of the deer as well, uh, for the most part. Right. I know somebody listening is going, well, that's crazy. I know six year old bucks that don't reach to have more than a hundred inches. It's all relative to your area, right. to your nutrition and genetics, and you know, in that area as well. So, but I think because of the surge, I mean, you've got Pursuit Channel, you've got Sportsman's Channel, you've got Outdoor Channel, you've got Sunday morning television, Saturday morning television, and um, it's become such a big business that yeah, I think a lot of emphasis is placed on you know antler size. And it's unfortunate because I think that that's what breeds a lot of that, um, 
illegal activity. You right. know what I mean? People are willing to to break the law and do whatever it takes. You know, hey, if I kill this 180 inch buck, I'm going to land another sponsor, or I'm going to make more money, or I'm going to get more Instagram followers, or something like that. Um, and there is that fine line when when it becomes part of your income. Um, you know, I've been very very fortunate that I've been able to make you know some money from you know from hunting. Uh, I can tell you, I don't really make money. I mean, money comes in, but it goes right back out, whether it's in um, food plots or it's going back into promoting the sport or paying for travel or paying for license and stuff like that. But right. nonetheless, I, I think um, when there's the money aspect uh, involved, it um, it does have a tendency to breed to breed into that. And, you know, you see a lot of people... Um, not to not to get on a soapbox here, but the whole Facebook and social media bashing. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody posts a picture of a hundred inch buck, and they're proud of that deer. If mm-hmm. they weren't proud of it, they wouldn't have posted a picture on social media. And then they get lit up like a Roman candle. People are like, "Oh, that was just a two year old. That was just a three year old. Should have let it go." Right. You know, my personal goals and and my personal um, thresholds that I put on what I decide I want to kill is different from what Joe blow or, or, or Jill blow, you know, wants to, wants to go kill. You know what I mean? Right. It all depends on where they're at in their hunting career or in their level of expertise. Um, and sometimes you where, and, I and sometimes where you hunt, know too. That we've both killed some small deer before when we were younger. You know? Oh yeah, man. It's like even the one, even the one I shot this year. You know what I mean? And he's not a he's not a hammer by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that where I was hunting, the opportunity to see something that was going to be significantly better than that was going to be minimal with the amount of time sure. I was going to have to hunt. And the in just the area that I was hunting that, and what I have access to, right? Um, so yeah. in that regard, it was I made a decision that like this is a buck that I'm I, I'm proud to take. Posted it on social media. Fortunately, no one lit me up, <laughs> but it definitely wasn't the caliber that I killed last year. You know, and it's like and I've shot my fair uh-huh. share of like small basket Pennsylvania six points growing up and spikes and all that stuff that you do as you as you come up through the ranks, you know what I mean? And, and, and I, everyone should have that experience. There's one thing that you mentioned is, you know, you'd mentioned, I think Michael Waddell says, you know, hunting, hunting culture has a problem right now, you know what I mean? In, in, yep. in general. Um, and I think, and he's right, you know, and, and you're right as well in terms of just kind of, you know, um, explaining the point of how social media is kind of works and people think that if they kill one more bigger buck, I'll get more followers or a better sponsor or more money or whatever the case might be. But I think it even goes just a little bit deeper than that, is that beyond the social piece of it, people, you know, and and this is just not even, I I think this goes for folks who work in the industry and folks who don't work in the industry, right? I think it actually works for both of these audiences. And one is that for those who are in the industry and have TV shows and are in the business of keeping up with the Joneses and stuff like that, is that their success or failure in their career begins to define them not define their career right but defining who they are and that's a very kind of scary bad place to be because i can kind of i can i can kind of relate whenever i was a musician when when the person who was on stage was starting to become the person who came home at night you know what i mean Uh like that's a scary place to be in because you stop being the person that you are you're always on so to speak, you know what I mean? And I'm seeing that in the hunting culture where it's becoming very entertainment music business, like where it's like that person Uh is always has this persona and that's who they are. And that's not really that person. They just turned into that because that's what they think everybody wants. It's also permeating just normal people then, because instead of being, you know, I'll use myself as an example, Clint, the guy who goes to work every day is a loving husband and a father and so on and so forth. And that's really what he should be 98% of the time is now every day is Clint deer hunter than everything else. Not saying that that's the case for me, but like me as an example where it starts to kind of define who you are and like when you talk to people and how, and how you talk to people and how you treat people, like when that starts becoming the defining driver for your relationships and Uh how you communicate with people, like you've stepped over the boundary and that's when you get into that gray area where you start to rationalize that it's okay to make poor decisions 
you relax, sure. you begin well, to, exp- you know, convince yourself that for some certain reason I can do X because it's okay because of this. Uh huh. You know? Yeah, that's right. Like you're uh, higher or above the law or whatever. And, uh, kind of like on, on the musician side of things, great analogy because when you're, you're playing an instrument, whether it's guitar or drums, whatever, and if you don't have a hit single or uh, a platinum selling album on the outside, the mm-hmm. non musicians look at it and say, Oh, well he must not be very good. Mm-hmm. But now the people that are musicians, they're like, man, that guy can play the hell out of that guitar. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Or, so, or the inverse, which same is that thing when, you, with hunting. when you start to have success and then the people who knew you back when have contempt for you because now they think you've sold out. You know what Correct. I mean? So it works both. It works in both ways, at yeah. least in that in that industry. But I'm sorry, go ahead and finish your thought. Well, well, and, and what I was going to say is, that, and then the nexus into the hunting world is, um, you know, I've I get me- I'll get a message or something from some of my friends back home in Kentucky, and um, they're not big big hunters. I mean, maybe they've gone out once or twice. And the worst is the ones that have gone out and got a got a great deer their very first hunt ever, and they haven't hunted since then. Right. So their perception is kind of skewed. <laughs> you know, they <laughs> yeah. uh, they haven't had those sits where you know you sit in a tree stand and you don't see anything. But you know, and I'll get a message from time to time from some of those folks back home, and and they're like, man, ever since you left Kentucky, you know, man, you've been struggling. You you forget how to hunt or what? And it, it's just kind of funny. Um, you know, my buddies that know me and my buddies that I hunt with, my buddies that I check cameras with and food plot with, and we talk strategy and stuff. Um, you know, they, they know you, sometimes you have an off year. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things don't go right. I mean, I've had opportunities. I had a wind swirl, shot a buck in the shoulder, didn't recover. I mean, but at the end of the year, maybe I don't tag a deer this year. Mm Mm-hmm. And to some people, they may look at it and say, well, well, he must not be a very good hunter. Right. You know what I mean? But um, so same thing goes for whether it's the hunting industry or or not. Some people, you know, they they don't understand some of the ins and outs that goes into a a whole hunting season or, you know, people that are as um, as dedicated uh, as a, you know, hunting is a 12 month a year passion. Right. Um, And it's. You know, it's tough. You know, you put all that work in and, and, you know, and, and on the bracket situation, I, I, you know, we've talked about it before. I hate poachers. Poachers suck. Yeah. Bottom line. Um, I, I just, I, I can't stand it. it. It bothers me. Um, that being said, I don't, uh, I'm not excusing, um, you know, it, let's say innocent until proven guilty. I get all that, but like you said, the evidence is pretty damning. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say that I, I agree with what he did, or it, but I do understand. You know, right. I understand the motivation that went behind it. I don't agree with it, and I would never do it. And uh, if guilty, then he should be should be found guilty. Um, right. But I can understand, you know, whether it be I was trying to you know, further the career, um, or land more sponsors and stuff like that. Sure. That that's a motive. I don't agree with that motive, but, um, right. But I can at least understand why, why poachers do what they do. Right. Yeah. And and like you said, it's like, I don't agree with the motive and I I get it. Like I understand like in, in, in stressful situations or in situations where you think you have an opportunity to advance yourself or whatever, it's hard to turn those things down to me. You know, at the end of the day, when you go through all these things, like all these triggers that we've talked about, whether it's social media or the honey, the pressure from having a show or whatever the case might be, you are the last gut check, right? You yourself. And that's, that's right. when your character shines or doesn't, right? Because having good character or exemplary character isn't defined by what you do when people are watching. So it's not defined by what you do whenever the camera's on, whenever you're in front of a crowd or whatever yep. the case might be. Yep. It's exemplified by what you do when nobody's watching. 
Um, yep. And that's when your true character is, is, is exposed. So in this case, I think, and it doesn't mean it's, um, you're, you know, <clears throat> unable to be amended necessarily. Everyone has an opportunity to, to better themselves. Um, to me, the poor decision that was made in the past two weeks with this gentleman is a lack of respect, you know, and it comes down. And to me, that's what it comes down to. I mean, you, if you watch the video and the way he treated the person who was behind camera, he clearly didn't have any respect for them. Um, doesn't have any yep. respect for the animals that he's hunting. Doesn't have any respect for the hunting community. And I, I would go as far as to say, probably doesn't have a whole lot of respect for himself. If, if I'm, you know, making a leap to a degree. But with that said, just like you had mentioned, you know, I, I am also slightly disappointed in the way that the hunting community kind of overreacted to what he's done too. Um, it seemed like it was just like an, an opportunity for everybody to pile on and kick a person after he's made a mistake. Like, I, look, I, it's, it's reprehensible what he did. It's, I hate poachers as much as the next guy, but yep. you know, is it really, do you, do you, I just think it's, I just think it's in poor taste to take the opportunity when someone has obviously made a mistake, um, whether it's multiple times they've made a mistake or whatever. And then and continually pile on the person as if they knew them. You know, some of the posts that I, I was reading, right. like as much venom as they had for somebody that they've only ever seen on TV. Like I, I don't care enough about someone who's not my direct family or friend <laughs> to be as that concerned about their their life <laughs> as some people as I've seen on social media concerned about a person who they've never met before. Um, yeah, I have a hard time disliking people in general. Uh, I have a real hard time disliking someone with that much hate that I've never said a single word to. Um, so that sure. I think for me was that that part of it too was a little bit disappointing to see just coming from our, our people. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's, um, it, it, it's social media, man. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, the joy and pain yeah, the keyboard of social muscles. media. It's, you know, you see somebody who kills a big buck and there's always, I, I love that meme where it shows kind of the nerdy dude with the, with the glasses and he's sitting at home at a, uh, a home PC mm-hmm. and the, the meme says something like, um, never killed a big buck, but screams high fence on the internet when somebody else does. <laughs> uh, it always makes me laugh, you yeah. know, because yeah. it, it happens all the time. I mean, you see somebody post like Don Higgins. You know, yep. talking about a phenomenal season he's had oh, and, man. and somebody made a post like, oh, probably high fence. And right. I'm like, seriously, you know, but um, like you said, you know, somebody rises to fame and people hate him because he rises to fame and somebody right. kills a big deer and, they, you know, they hate him because they killed a big deer and, you know, whatnot. But, um, you know, to kind of circle back to, I think from the media perspective, from the outside looking in, if somebody's given the opportunity that they have a successful show, I mean, bracket show got several golden moose awards, Mm -hmm. uh, have to definitely tip the hat to chip Spalding, you know, chip city, phenomenal editor, Mm -hmm. uh, probably, probably one of the, the top editors, in my opinion, in the business right now. Um, just a, just a genius, you know, when it comes to editing footage and stuff, really, really talented guy. And a lot of that, it comes to the golden moose awards comes back to, you know, a lot of his work he did behind the scenes, but, um, you know, if somebody's given a position, I mean, I don't know, I forget how many millions of hunters there are, you know, in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would venture to say 97% would probably give up a couple of limbs, a toe, maybe mm-hmm. even a reproductive organ <laughs> to be on a hunting show. Right. Yeah. To be able to hunt for a living. Yeah. Um, so I, I think same thing with like a sports uh, figure. When you're given that position, um, you may not want to be a role model. At the end of the day, you are a role model to some regard, and it's kind of disrespectful to the industry um, mm-hmm. to be given given that kind of position, and then to to screw it up like that, to take advantage of it. And you know, you have to hold yourself. When I was a police officer, we used to always talk about it all the time. I mean, you have to hold yourself to a higher level than say a normal person. Um, that was one of the things that they always talked about. You know, when you're put in that position, you you have to act accordingly. So I think as, as much as an opportunity as a hunting celebrity is given to be able to hunt for a living and that's their job, 
which I can also say it's not all it's not all beans and cornbread, you know, yeah. like there's some, there is some stuff, some tough stuff from day to day. You don't know if you're going to lose a sponsor or not. You don't know if you're going to be able to pay for your airtime. Um, you know, come, come January 1st of, of a year or February 1st of a year, you've got an 80 to $150,000 payment that you got to make to one of the networks, you know, to put your show on there. And you hope mm-hmm. that your sponsors are going to have your back and help you pay for that show. So there is some stress that comes along with it, but at the end of the day, you have a show, you got millions of people that watch your show. There's young kids that are looking up to you, you know, and things like that. Um, that that's a part that also I have a problem with mm-hmm. is to uh, to to break a game violation to to break a game law like that is um, it's kind of disrespectful to the opportunity that was given you know and to be a representative of the sport to be a sportsman to be a steward you know of the sport um, I I I have an issue with that but yeah. you know as far as public bashing of people that do it I'm not their judge. Yep. You know, I'm not a DNR officer. Um, you know, can I talk behind the scenes locker room talk with my buddies about the situation? You know, um, I kind of knew about this situation, uh, some of the background stuff as as the news was, you know, as it was developing. And right. I never made the first post, never made the first comment, um, you know he will be judged by his peers and, and maybe by state uh, local authorities. And, and that's where it'll, that's where it'll settle, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I like what you said just about the, 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 the piece about the role models. stuff. I always like the quote that, you know, to whom much is afforded, much is required. And yep. I think this is one of those situations um, where he didn't, he didn't meet the, the standard in terms of the requirement. Um, Correct. And, yep. uh, and you're right. You know, he will have his, his day to, to, you know, explain things to whomever it needs to be explained to. And, um, it'll be, it'll be managed through those, those channels, like you suggested. And, um, you know, he'll have, have to answer if he intend, I don't know whether he would intend to try to work in the outdoor industry, you know, after this or beyond this, but he'll have to answer to his actions, of course, in that regard as well. I think it's going to be an uphill battle to say the least. Um, but you know, like straight uphill, yeah, climbing a cliff, yeah, like uh, get yourself uh, some carabiners and some rope and some uh, and uh, some hand chalk because you'll be uh, yeah, you'll be cliff hanging a little bit. Um, but uh, I think um, with that, we can uh, we can move on to uh, to happier topics. Uh, to start wrapping this uh, this show up, as uh, as I'd mentioned before, everyone out there that's listening, if you listen to the day that it came out, or at least in the first few days it's come out, you're probably listening to this over the course of the the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. So, uh, John and I, of course, want to wish all of you out there uh, a happy Thanksgiving. But since we kind of go from the, the the negative portion of talking about poaching and, and things like that, we thought we would just take a minute and uh, kind of say what we're thankful for as we head into the the holiday, and we'll end this thing on a. Uh, on a positive note here, because here at Truth From The Stand and Arrow Wild Company, we are positive, positive people. Isn't that right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you better be positive with the season we're having. <laughs> I know. Exactly, man. So, uh, John, man, what are, you, uh, what are you thankful for? What's on your thankful list? Uh, you know, this is, um, I, I've used this one before um, on, on a video, and it, and it still applies. You know, we've obviously, we've had a, a, a podcast session where we're, We've um, we've expressed our displeasures with maybe a particular hunting piece that we had, or mm-hmm. the lack of time to study the hunting piece, or maybe like you said, not be aggressive enough in in times when you should have been. Um, the thing that I, I am truly thankful for is um, on the hunting side of things is that the opportunity to hunt, mm-hmm. yeah. to have places to go hunt. They may not be the best places in the world, but you know what? They're places to go hunt. And I still get to take my bow up and down a tree stand with the hopes of possibly seeing, you know, seeing a wild creature out there running around. So, um, on the family side of things, um, man, you know, the wife and kids are doing great. Kids yeah. are doing good. It's our second year in Iowa, and everybody's truly adjusted at this point. And you know, the kids have got they've got their friends now in school. So, um, you know, that was beyond their control. You right. know, dad decided we're up and moving to Iowa. So. 
uh, kind of uprooted them from everything that they knew, but they, they've adjusted and, uh, on the friend side of things, um, extremely thankful for a lot of the good hunting friends that I've made, uh, recently. Uh, I'm actually in, in my office, uh, one of my good buddies, Dustin Jones from, from the web show. He's, um, he's down here hanging out with me and, and he's a new guy that I met since I moved here. So I'm very thankful uh, for friends like that yourself. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, my buddy Brad and Luke, a couple of new friends that I've become real tight with here recently through this hunting season. So, and the list goes on and on, but, um, that's, that's the stuff I'm thankful for. And it's funny cause I didn't think of a big deer. I didn't think an encounter of a big deer it has nothing to do with that. Right. It's uh, the hunting friends and the, the, the camaraderie that comes with it. Yeah. No, I hear that, man. For me, you know, I think, you know, I'll, I'll kind of do, I'll go through the same kind of process you did and just think about the hunting side of things. You know, I, I think, you know, echo your sentiments there as far as like being thankful to have places to go. You know, I think as important, you know, thankful for those folks who, who are, who are out there that work hard, um, that often go unnamed that, um, you know, make sure that we have those places to go to. Um, you know, I don't think that they obviously get enough, enough thanks. And, you know, those are the folks that like, you know, at the QDMA and those are folks at, you know, the NDA and the folks at back, uh, country hunters and anglers and just people like that who are doing the dirty work to make sure that we continue to have wild and free places to, to enjoy the hunting experiences that we, that we have an opportunity to go take part in. Um, you know, without them, you know, we'd probably, I don't know what we'd be doing, crocheting maybe, or playing bocce ball or something, but <laughs> certainly not hunting. <laughs> um, you know, so I want to, want to say thanks to all those folks. want to say thanks, of course, to, you know, you know, I, this podcast started just about a year and a half, year and a half and some change ago, roughly. Um, thankful for all the people who listen that, you know, uh, give enough of a damn to tune in to listen to you and I talk about deer hunting, which is pretty freaking cool. Um, and the guests that have, yeah. you know, the guests that decide to come on probably against their better judgment, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, and then of course on the family side of things, um, you know, the wife and kid are doing good, you know, thank we bought a house this year, which was, you know, several years in the, in the making to, to happen. So, you know, super thankful for that. And again, our daughter had to change schools, you know, not quite as drastic as your family as far as like changing states and stuff, but she's acclimated well and has a bunch of great friends and stuff like that. And then just like you said, man, it's like this, you know, getting involved in doing a show like this and giving an opportunity to meet a lot of cool people, super thankful that you came on the show, you know what I mean? And our friendship and relationship has grown. And so I'm super thankful for that. And just all the people that I've got to meet, like all my hunting buddies and stuff like that, the old, the old hunting buddies, the new hunting buddies, guys that I go shoot bows with and stuff like that. It's just, and the list goes on and on, like just super cool people. And as, as much as sometimes we can get on and rail against some of the hunting industry stuff that happens in social media and stuff like that, it's like, man, there are a lot more good people out there than there are bad people. And I think people just need to remember that, that there's a lot of good folks out there doing good things that do things the right way and are committed to making sure that this sport is represented the right way. You just may not always know their name, but but they're out there. So super thankful for those folks. And, uh, I think that's it, man. I think that's what, I think that's what I'm thankful for. I think I'll, as always my tradition, when we have Thanksgiving, um, as a side note, my wife's family is, uh, um, my wife, my wife's mother's a pastor. Um, and so Thanksgiving is usually a pretty somewhat formal time. Everyone takes a kernel of corn out of this basket and then they pass the basket around and you throw the kernel of corn in the basket and you say what you're thankful for. Um, uh-huh. and, uh, it, there's usually a lot of heartfelt thanks and rightly so. Um, I just can't be super serious a lot of times in front of <laughs> lots of people. So every year it comes to me in the first year that we did this or the first year that I did this with them. Um, I couldn't take like the seriousness of it. So I, I took a quote from Talladega Nights and said I was thankful for my stone cold fox wife. I screamed, ow, <laughs> and I slapped her on the ass. <laughs> that was my thankfulness. Uh, that's good. Yeah, so that'll be coming up Thursday. So anyone out there who, who's uh, who's listening, you know, if, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, um, go ahead and hit me in I am on Facebook and let me know what my next Talladega Night quote should be uh, at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> I could use some help. I'm running out of tal- I'm run- running out of Ricky Bobby quotes, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, so man, I think that's it, dude. I think that's, uh, I think we've, we've talked for a little over getting onto an hour and a half here. So I think I'll let you get back. Yep. You, you got early bedroll, I'm sure. Cause you got probably an early morning, morning stand session and, uh, I got to go yep, back to the, gotta, the grind. I'll be, uh, getting up here 4 30 AM central time. 
All right, man. Well, then let's go ahead and shut this thing down, brother. Have a good hunt tomorrow. I appreciate it, brother. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. Before we shut this thing down, here is how you can enter one last time to win the Exodus Lift 2 Trail Camera. All you have to do is go to our Truth From The Stand About page, and that is truthfromthestand.com slash about, and sign up for our email newsletter. You can also submit through the sign-up button on the Truth From The Stand Facebook page. Those two things, easy peasy, get you entered to possibly win the Exodus 2 Lift Trail Camera. Once we've received 200 entries, we'll do a drawing for the winner. So once we hit that 200 entry number, uh, we will go ahead and randomly draw a name, and that will be the winner of the Exodus 2 uh, or Lift 2 camera. And with that, be sure to follow us. Make sure you're following us on Facebook and Instagram if you are not already uh, doing so. Of course, we want to thank all of you for listening, and be sure to hit the iTunes subscribe button so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. And finally, I need to give a big shout out to our partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. Whitetail Institute of North America, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Lone Wolf Portable Tree Stands. And until next time, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Rationalize yourself in numbers, but I gotta get away from me.